Okay, so now we look at uh, what are the expectations that have to be met when the product is being released for market. So at this stage, everything that was agreed for design and reliability test is all <coughs> accepted, it has been proven, there is no remaining activity. The first requirement, regulatory approvals, a product cannot be released without that. So again, evidence of that. <coughs> then manufacturing has made the number of requisite number of batches to verify that they can meet the rate of production. <coughs> Field tests are satisfactory. There is nothing abnormal being discovered by field tests. So field test is typically a process to discover the unknown. If you look at our case study in railways, vibration was something that was discovered. And it was not through a planned field um, test, but it was discovered in a running production routine. But in um, products of high volume, you do a field trial just to be sure that there is nothing that has been left out because of something not being so obvious at the time of framing of uh, test plans. Again, it is to reduce the risk of uh, the commercial risk of a product launch. And then parts, the supply chain agreement, all that is completed, the needed levels of quality in terms of um, acceptable parts that may turn out to be defective and all that is um, predicted, accepted, suppliers have agreed. and production personnel are trained and available. Then there is a whole lot of uh, work that happens in the manufacturing domain, which is assembly and certification, whether it is training of people, value streams, manufacturing and the scale up and improvement plans. And very often <coughs> when there is um, an external product compliance uh, a need which is mandatory like in india now we have the star rating program so products can be picked up from the market put to a <coughs> lab test a third party lab test and if they're not complying to what has been rated on the label of the product then there is a penalty and a risk of reputation for the manufacturer so to overcome all those risks at the manufacturing level that has to be gauge r and r and then there is a <coughs> an estimate of any failures of product on a regular ongoing method then process capability is mapped for all the critical parameters so in a air conditioner the critical parameters would be energy efficiency ratio and cooling capacity which is a derivative again of um, cooling capacity and power consumption so all that has to be falling within the defined uh, norm of uh, 3% at the manufacturing level if uh, they are to meet an external requirement of 5% So now you had asked me for another case study last time. So the case study is here. And the case study we will look at is uh, a product designed for telecom cooling. So the first case study was something that um, I had an opportunity to be a part of in 1995 to 1998. This one is more recent. It is in the period of 2008 to 2009. So some background to this is, uh, at a telecom shelter, so right now the technology is changing. So the air conditioning needs in a telecom shelter are coming down and with 4G services, we don't need to air condition the equipment at the transmission point. But for 2G services and 3G services, the equipment has to be kept below 30 degrees centigrade. And that creates the need for some air conditioner, or a specific purpose-built air conditioner for meeting that need. So this is very different from comfort. So comfort, we are targeting uh, more in the region of 25, testing at 27, here it is 30 degrees centigrade. So, and then it is going to be year-round operation, 24 by 7 throughout the year. So the energy needs are going to be much more significant. And since in India we have power shortages, so there will be times when this unit will run on a DG set. So the OPEX will be driven by a combination of cost of power and cost of fuel. So there is tremendous uh, focus on keeping the energy uh, costs, the operational costs low. And then the entire heat load is because of, um, I mean, it's sensible heat. There is no moisture being added in the shelter. So if we try and uh, 
apply this as a, you know, some way of mapping the customer requirements. Some things are pretty straightforward, that you want to maintain 30 degrees centigrade or lower. The heat load comes out as an input because of the equipment that is inside the shelter. So the customer has no problem sharing this. Uh, and then the location anywhere in India, which means we can look at the worst operating condition in India and then based on that design the product. So just for you to know, if we look at the last 30 years temperature data in India, we will find that the max temperature ever recorded, and this is based on what I reviewed in 2008, the max ever recorded temperature is 50 degrees centigrade by the MET department. After that, if there have been some instances of it going by a few points above, I'm not sure, that is kind of a number that you can remember. And then energy efficiency, the customer wanted energy efficiency ratio of three or more. And uh, the other things are uh, kind of derived because of the nature of application. We want to have a low operating cost and then high reliability. So the components have to be looked at uh, differently because they're going to be in a 24 by 7 application environment. And the need for remote monitoring. The nature of spread of these units is such that uh, if a service guy needs to visit, it would be helpful if he knew what was wrong with the unit. So if there could be communication to a central point about possible you know, guess he could make as to what's wrong with the unit. Has a compressor failed, a fan failed, or is it just a damper issue? Yeah. Now in this, <clears throat> there is a unique feature, opportunity. Because this unit is going to be operating year round, there's an opportunity in the winter month, months to use the cooling that is available from ambient air. So you're going to maintain 30. And in winters, what are the temperatures you will encounter? somewhere in the region of 4 to 24. If you look at months of November to Feb. So if you are really looking at it as an opportunity, then how would you use this for cooling? It's very unconventional. It creates an opportunity for integrating a unique feature. So what can we do such that the compressor need not run in the winter months. This is an insulated box. This is the insulation. And then we have equipment which is generating heat. And we have some air conditioners which are cooling. So you have supply air which is coming here going back to a unit, and there's an AC. So this conventional solution is there. And now we're looking at condition where the outdoor temperature is, uh, let's say, 12 degrees centigrade. Let's take case of Delhi. And we want to cool this without using the compressor. Right. Simple, huh? And then what do we need to do? Create an opening? So one simple straightforward thing could be that we create a, a cutout over here. We have a unit which has a fan and then we create another cutout maybe somewhere here. So when we are taking air from here, it is passing over this, throwing it out. Right? Now what would it look like if this feature has to be integrated into the AC? What we said is feasible, but it would require someone manually switching that unit on, switching the air conditioner off. So one of the things we can derive is that if there was a sensor related um, switch, which could switch off and switch on. But from a technology perspective, if you wanted to provide that in one simple unit, so that that air conditioner is unique. So the air conditioner we can say is, so this is the evaporator coil and here is the supply air. 
So this is normal circulation. How could we integrate within the AC mm. some combination of controls, dampers to take outside air when the temperature is sufficiently low? So the opening that you talked about, instead of having it in the, un in the shelter, we could have it in the AC. So let us say we create an opening in the AC. And then we would need to have a means of blocking this and opening it. So this is what was created as a feature. So instead of drawing it all over again, I will use this uh, sketch. So in the normal cooling mode, return air comes in. This damper in the normal position is actually sealed on this side as well as this side. So the return air comes over the cooling coil into the blower and it is thrown back into the shelter. And this is when the compressor is in operation. And the outside temperature is higher than the set point for the free cooling mode. So in the free cooling mode, when the temperature outside the shelter is <coughs> lower than the set point, then what do we have? The damper moves it from its position and outside air comes. So the same blower is used to take air from outside and throw it into the room and the exhaust air goes through another part of the opening into the environment. So this whole thing gets integrated together and it creates a unique opportunity. Now, how big is this opportunity? in terms of um, energy savings. So if you look at the temperature of Delhi, the outdoor air temperature, number of hours in a year, this is the number of hours in a year when the temperature is below 20. And then this is the number of hours when it is between 20 and 26. And very soon we will come to the reason why we have categorized these two parts separately. And then here is the condition where it is between 26 and 35. Clearly, the number of hours when the unit will operate with the compressor on. And then this is the number of hours when it is greater than 35. So when we operate the unit in free cooling mode for temperatures below 20, the <coughs> enthalpy of air is low. So we have much more um, opportunity for the same quantity of air. So we drop down the CFM of air by just operating one unit. So this is an example where we are looking at uh, either two units. So two free cooling units operating or one free cooling unit operating out of a shelter. And we can come back to this detail a little more after we have seen the design of the unit. But what it translates into is effectively a total average power consumption of 728 watts, 0.728 kilowatts versus what it would be is some average of these two numbers if we were not using the free cooling mode. So this is the number <coughs> and again kilowatts if we were using just the compressor cooling mode. So the savings that we are generating here so 42 percent energy we are saving by integrating this concept <coughs> and then if you start doing the maths of the number of shelters and all that, it becomes a very strong business case. And that was the reason why telecom sector was very quick to take these units. The specs were formed, uh, the specs were framed, the competition units were benchmarked with uh, each other and orders were placed. And there is one thing which was uh, the rollout of uh, telecom infrastructure and the rollout of these specialized uh, units integrated with free cooling was kind of rapid and driven by this particular um, uh, savings opportunity. One of the things to remember is that when you are doing new product design, if you get to something unique, as unique as this, then you can be sure that if you are among the first to market, you have a real opportunity for making good profits. If you are own company, then for yourself or for the company that you are working for. Now then when we started building this uh, design, this is to give you an idea of what kind of components um, were developed. So this is the evaporator coil and in the evaporator coil, you can now see some of the detailing. So there is a distributor here and the function of the distributor if you remember from some earlier discussions is to 
spread refrigerant equally between different parts of the coil. So it is a 1 ton, I mean roughly 1 ton unit, but we are using 3 separate circuits to optimize it for pressure drop. And it is a high sensible unit, uh, a high sensible heat capacity unit which means larger surface area, again requiring more number of tubes. So to reduce the pressure drop, 3 circuits are used, where conventionally even 2 would suffice in a residential unit. And then the details of this probably you do not need. But to get to <coughs> good performance at high ambient temperatures, a condenser coil which was bent into a U shape was used and the discharge was kept vertical. Then there was also a need for looking at um, a high pressure refrigerant 410A for some um, markets and for that uh, there was a new type of a heat exchanger that was considered. And this is a, a, a special micro channel heat exchanger with the <coughs> fins stacked between flat tubes of aluminum, similar to what you see in car radiators. And this is today also being used in the residential sector for lower cost um, condenser coils. Then here we have the fan. So for purposes of ensuring high reliability, a German fan was utilized for this application, sourced from EBM. And again, it had to undergo the usual qualification processes for withstanding uh, shower tests so that uh, if installed in vertical condition, it is not going to have uh, water ingress and uh, failure of motors because of that reason. Then to give you a glimpse of the kind of um, specification comparison that goes in before one invests on a imported component of high cost. So different uh, fans were benchmarked and uh, <coughs> before I go forward I must also mention that um, these telecom shelter unit, cooling units need to be performing for short durations um, on battery and if there is not enough power available then <coughs> the blower can be made to operate on 48 volt DC. So for that reason, there is a unique specification for this product that the blower would run at 48 volt DC and if there was no power available for short durations, the blower itself in the free cooling mode will keep the unit uh, under acceptable temperature conditions. It may not stay below 30, but it will still vent the… So this was uh, just to illustrate how components uh, are benchmarked and compared. Uh, so in addition to performance for cost as well. And these are the drawings of the final unit. You can see the condenser discharging vertically up. These are uh, air uh, intake uh, points. And this surface is the one which is flush with the shelter. What you see here is a, a damper. So the damper actuator is uh, outside and this moves the uh, damper from one point to another when we switch from uh, regular cooling to free cooling. Now there is only this much that I can show you of this for the product. So now I'll show you a product picture of the real product. <coughs> so this product was called high efficiency energy efficient high energy efficiency unit HEER and it was designed to maintain temperature in telecom shelters. It is uh, all that we already talked about for energy savings, um, ambient temperatures as well as free cooling. So it was a factory charged unit. It did not require any uh, field charging and to that extent it was a simple uh, quick and direct uh, installation. And the emergency cooling that is listed here as a feature is the one I talked about using a DC fan. And then there was a controller which would take care of um, two units. So there is a feature required for runtime equalization. You invested on two units, you might as well get the max out of the units by rotating their duties. So the second unit is on standby in case uh, one unit fails, the other one will come in operation and then this controller would communicate to the central point for a service, the need for maintenance. Mm -hmm. Then <coughs> the features of high pressure, low pressure were both built in and there was a display to indicate the uh, temperature as well as set point 
and this also had uh, the high and low voltage protection features and uh, status LEDs indicating if there is any fault in the unit. So between the time this unit was uh, designed um, and uh, a year, 20,000 units were um, installed. So it was rapid commercialization once the product uh, met its desired objective. And uh, there was competition, so uh, this product was tested in a third party lab at Intertech in a balanced ambient calorimeter. This is a second type of uh, uh, test method where <clears throat> in a room you maintain a certain temperature and then the entire heat added in that room is measured. So you don't rely on the air enthalpy method for getting the capacity. You look at the real heat and moisture addition that is happening in the room on both sides. So we qualified this product and it was uh, the best of all that was benchmarked based on the customer report. I had nothing, no say in whatever was uh, measured because the lab was independent, the customer had his own orders for testing the product and uh, <coughs> it of course generated tremendous confidence on the company to supply. These are some details about the product in terms of um, how much of airflow. Primarily it had 600 CFM of uh, air um, in the AC mode and 900 CFM of air in the um, free cooling mode. And that <coughs> would lead to a certain um, uh, a cooling capacity in the free cooling mode which is 3.53 uh, kilowatt. Or you could also look at free cooling as a watt per degree Kelvin, which is uh, listed at 505. So based on the enthalpy difference on just the dry bulb, you can easily calculate the cooling capacity of um, the unit using pressure. And this is just showing again in the product how the two fans performed, um, locally manufactured equivalent of a German fan. and. Uh, for reasons of reliability, of course, the design continued to make use of uh, the imported fan. <coughs> this is a way to look at um, an application uh, from a unit spec point of view. As I was talking to you, I will look at some payback calculations using the number of units. So here we look at <coughs> the cooling capacity. 3517 watts uh, with 1265 watts of power consumption, a sensible heat factor of 0.9 and the CFM in the free cooling mode is 900. So for an application which makes use of 4 units of such type, one can look at some energy analysis. And this is essentially derived from the same sheet that I just shared with you. So the compressor cooling. Uh, is eliminated and leads to something in the region of 40 percent energy savings. And if you apply it on different shelters, then we can uh, look at uh, the annual savings opportunity in a year versus different alternative scenarios. So with this, the case study is more or less complete. I mean, the business case, the design, uh, and uh, uh, the comparison for components. Now we look at some of the emerging technologies that are coming up. So, and one of the newer technologies is uh, an oil-free uh, compressor, which is used for chillers. So you're going to look at that. So before we go there, let's start looking at the history of chillers. So the first centrifugal chiller was introduced in 1922 by Willis Carrier. It was an open drive compressor running at 3600 RPM and had four stages. From then there has been evolution in technology. So from field assembled units it has moved to um, factory assembled units uh, and uh, instead of building at site using cast heat exchanger shells, now we are looking at um, rolled heat exchanger shells flooded evaporator and newer refrigerants. And 
<coughs> the latest is oil free high efficiency um, uh, compressor system where there is redundancy and uh, active surge control which means capacity control and low vibration and noise. So here <coughs> the one on the right is the uh, newer technology. So the company I work for Danfoss had, uh, has a separate division called Danfoss Turbocore and that is the company to first introduce a oil free uh, bearing where the compressor rotating shaft is magnetically levitated and there is complex electronics to keep it uh, in, uh, a, at a fixed uh, distance from the metal surfaces <laughs> using magnetic forces. So, so what you are going to see here next is. Uh, so we are looking at uh, what 3600 rpm when it was introduced in 1922 and now we are looking at 48000 rpm. So <clears throat> one can ask this question as to why do we need to go oil free. So if we looked at some of the reliability concerns earlier it was around oil coming back to the compressor or oil being there in the compressor and that was to address um, a longer life. If we eliminate the need for lubrication, we have created a unique opportunity where refrigerant uh, flows mm. without any obstruction, without any uh, real uh, compatibility issues with any um, oil. We talked about oils leading to short exposure times for compressors um, because they are hygroscopic, that is eliminated. There would be pressure drops because of oil in the system pipelining, that would be eliminated. So the oil free magnetic bearings are one of the unique things in emerging technologies and the, this is uh, finding um, increasing acceptance and also more and more companies are trying to find ways to beat any patents that um, one company has by uh, doing some work around on the technology. The capacities that are available 90 tons to 200 tons for the compressor but the chillers can go right up to 1000 tons using multiple compressors. And right now this product is manufactured in the US only. If you look at some of the components, this compressor has an inbuilt um, variable speed control, what is written here as inverter um, speed control. It has a soft start, so a big compressor, 90 ton compressor just has uh, 2 amperes of start current. A typical uh, residential compressor may have 40 to 60 amperes of lock rotor current. So that is the kind of technology evolution that is happening. <clears throat> then it is a two stage centrifugal compressor with uh, mm, a lot of instrumentation. So there are pressure and temperature sensors to monitor this, there are inlet guide vanes for um, modulating the capacity and then there is a motor and bearing control um, mm, uh, region along with a permanent magnet motor and the magnetic bearings. So let us look at it a little more in detail as to what this uh, whole technology is around. So here we have the two impellers which lead to two stages of the compression process and there is one bearing sensor together with a radial bearing, we just ignore this radius bearing, it is a radial bearing, so the front radial bearing and there is a rear radial bearing and then there is one axial bearing. So the whole technology is to pick up the location of the shaft and adjust the magnetic forces to centralize it and doing this continuously at a very high rapid speed is what makes this technology feasible. So it is more like you know you hold this pen and then if you can control the forces, so you do not let it drop, you do not let it touch the top side and do not move it axially. If you have done that successfully using magnetic forces, then you have an oil free compressor. This is the only moving part in this compressor. Well, the people who developed this technology who have found it uh, successful with the high speeds and uh, one of the reasons they have used high speeds is to reduce the cost overall size and cost of the compressor. See when we run a normal motor, uh, the governing factor is the frequency that is available. So you would have 50 hertz in India, 60 hertz in the US, 
and more or less that. So multiples of that would determine the rotating speed. The moment you have converted electrical power into um, DC and you are using magnetic uh, forces, then you have an opportunity to run at whatever speeds you want to. So you can alter the frequencies and if you are doing an R&D program, you would like to create a unique value that others cannot quickly catch up with. So with high speeds and smaller sizes, you can make the overall chiller footprint smaller. So that becomes one of the trying factors. So the rotor shaft is held in position with 10 separately controlled electromagnetics which continually change in strength to keep the shaft centrally positioned, axially and radially. And sensors monitor the position over 6 million times a minute. So look at the level of processing power that would be needed to make this work. To illustrate what I was saying about centralizing uh, uh, the shaft inside the bearing, so these are some of the, the details of how the radial and axial part is, uh, actually the two radial bearings and then the one axial bearing. So if you look at the summary of benefits of this type of a compressor. So when uh, a product is uh, designed using, let's say, this compressor, then the contamination levels that are acceptable in the system would be uh, more demanding. They would be more demanding for sure. But in any case, in a refrigeration system, there is a lot of um, requirement for cleanliness, even without a magnetic bearing, because uh, any, uh, let's say there is a metal forming process, you are cutting the tube. Even the current level of specs, without using a um, magnetically levitated compressor, require that uh, they are uh, kept within a certain specified limit, not for reasons of uh, magnetic, but because they can come between moving parts of the compressor and cause seizure. So the whole um, efficiency of a compressor motor is driven by how much of a gap you have between the stator and rotor. So that uh, has already been uh, limiting the level of contamination that is acceptable. And a lot of contamination gets generated in the compressor. When there is no metal to metal contact, then you are actually in this design uh, creating an opportunity of not having this uh, contamination come up. So because of this uh, high level of um, calibration needed to run the shaft centrally, you will have low noise and vibration. The single rotating component makes the manufacturing uh, less complex and the reliability is higher because of fewer components, it's very simple. Variable speed becomes possible because of the investment made in <coughs> an inverter, so capacity regulation is, is a key benefit. Soft start I talked to you about, low current, 2 amperes. And then <clears throat> it makes use of an environment friendly refrigerant R134A, which is uh, non ozone depleting, but it has global warming potential. And then we have um, a new refrigerant HFO1234ZE. And that is a new refrigerant with a very low global warming potential as well as uh, zero ODP. And of course, the benefits of um, digital electronics. <coughs> then because of its being oil free, it is possible to run it slower than conventional compressors which rely on oil for lubrication. Below a certain speed, oil will not return back to the compressor or you need a certain pressure drop, uh, pressure build up for uh, lubricating oil to flow. So all those things are eliminated and then you can use multiple compressors together, allowing a, <coughs> a lower uh, part load uh, operation. So this is a comparison between a single uh, centrifugal variable speed compressor, which is the first one, 
and then a single oil-free centrifugal variable speed compressor and multiple oil-free centrifugal variable speed compressors. So as you can see, the multiple oil-free centrifugal variable speed compressors offer the highest uh, part load efficiencies. Then we can look at uh, some <coughs> robustness issues. So we looked at uh, failures that happen um, because of power related things. So what happens to this compressor? It has been made so sensitive, it is dependent on electronics and suddenly you have no power, what's going to happen? So that's been built into the design. So within <coughs> half of a microsecond, this compressor would begin to generate power. So it will switch from being a power uh, consumer to generating power and that power is used to slow it down so that it gradually comes to rest. It doesn't bang on the thing in the absence of. And then when power resumes, it is back in operation in 29 seconds. Now, this high speed of shaft of oil free compressor can achieve compression ratios of 5.5, making the compressor suitable for a wider set of applications. Wider meaning it can be used for air cooled in addition to water cooled. And, uh, there is an increasing trend of using adiabatic pads with some condenser coils. So I don't know too much of detail about that, but it is an option. This is a little bit on the operating envelope of this compressor. So there are different models and TT350 is one of them. With this I would like to close the lecture and uh, also it is the final uh, session. So I open up. Thank you.